Long before the phrase pumping iron became part of our everyday fitness vocabulary, it was the title of a low-budget documentary that would defy the odds to become a cult classic. On the 25th anniversary of that film, Cinemax presents the story behind the making of Pumping Iron, the film that introduced the world to a charismatic 28-year-old bodybuilding champion known as Arnold. With never-before-seen outtakes from the film, the only thing that's left is Arnold's bullshit. Uh, <laughs> as well as candid comments from the cast and crew, 25 years after the film was released. About the time when I first saw it, I was like mortified, saying, oh my god. I went overboard many times. We were really struggling to get the movie made, and people were laughing at us. Cinemax presents a tale of sweat, muscle, ego, and glory in the golden age of bodybuilding. Raw iron. The making of pumping iron. February, Columbus, Ohio. Arnold Schwarzenegger is in town for the Arnold Classic, the annual bodybuilding competition he's produced since 1976. Along with Mr. Olympia, it's the premier contest in the sport. Bodybuilding has come a long way since Pumping Iron was released in 1977. The contestants are bigger than ever, and so is the stage show. The Arnold Classic is an extravaganza to rival any big ticket rock concert. And bodybuilding's become big ticket too. These days, more than 175,000 bodybuilders compete in 169 countries. Today, Schwarzenegger is here to hand out more than $400,000 in prizes. But he's also here to see some old friends who have gathered backstage. Many of the original bodybuilders from the Pumping Iron era. Bill Grant, Ed Corney, Mike Katz, Franco Colombo, and Lou Ferrigno. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Terrific. There, there was camaraderie. We helped each other. We trained each other. We were a part of a family. Where's your son? Where's Michael? Right there. Michael, come over here. Michael. Oh, Michael. How's it going? Good. Okay, good to see you. 25 years ago, we saw in Pumping Iron, we saw the little Michael. He was three years old. And then he made you pose. Remember, he made you hit shots. Ooh, it's hard. Feel this muscle, how hard that is. Just everyone is so huge. What's going on here? I'm the oh. Still got it. 25 years Can you years believe later. that? Pumping Iron. It changed my whole life. Are you going to give him all the wrong advice? advices? <laughs> it's not that hard for me to give him the wrong advices. No, no, only the right advice. <laughs> it was so much fun and enthusiasm. Great. Oh. <laughs> it was incredible. I like let me tell you, she said, now she, uh, her mother talking about my mother, he's talking about pumping up. He's talking about pumping up, he's talking about psyching me out. He couldn't shut me up then, he can't shut me up now. No, it's always the same, nothing has changed. Whenever I think back on, on the pumping iron days, in the 1975, when we did this movie, I, I, I definitely miss it. Back before pumping iron, he was known as the Austrian Oak, but he was unknown outside the marginal and misunderstood sport called competitive bodybuilding. It was a tiny little world, and 300 people would come to the contest that night. They would go crazy over Arnold Schwarzenegger, so he was king of 300 people. Oh wow. It's just that Arnold hadn't burst out of that world yet. Photographer George Butler and writer Charles Gaines were fascinated with the bodybuilding subculture and collaborated on a book they called Pumping Iron, which featured the young Austrian bodybuilder. Butler wanted to turn it into a film, but Arnold wanted to retire. Since moving to America in 1968, he'd won the sport's top prize, Mr. Olympia, an unprecedented five times, and he'd had enough. George Butler came to me and said, I have a great idea. We should do a movie. Uh, but it only will work if you're in it. And if you retire now, you can't be in it. So that doesn't work. Butler knew the weird and wacky world of bodybuilding had all the makings of a fascinating movie. But how to get investors aboard, it would be a tough sell.
It was, after all, the 70s, the height of the counterculture revolution. The last thing on anyone's mind was muscle men. It gave me a very formidable obstacle to overcome, which is to say, how do I make Arnold Schwarzenegger fashionable in the era in which the most celebrated model in the world was Twiggy? In the back of my mind, I knew that throughout history, there had always been at least one worldwide bodybuilder. Sandow, in the, at the turn of the century, was one of the highest paid entertainers in the world. Charles Atlas in the 20s and 30s. Steve Reeves in the 50s made a fortune in the movies. After convincing Arnold to compete for one more Mr. Olympia title, first time director Butler jumped headfirst into filmmaking. Okay, you got the eight? Eight. That's late. Just um, talk to these two guys here. Just... The concept was simple. Shoot the intense training leading up to the Mr. Olympia, then shoot the competition itself. Just let the story unfold in front of the camera. He started by shooting a test film for investors. In this never-before-seen footage, the first frames ever shot for pumping iron, Arnold pumps up backstage for a posing exhibition. When Nixon gets <laughs> it's just uh, too much pressure, you know. I mean, I'm competing now for 10 years, and after 10 years, I feel like it's enough, you know. You have to let other people have a chance, and uh, just leave us a winner. Yeah. Suppose Louis beats you. He doesn't. There's no such thing. <laughs> For years now, since 1970, I was like unbeatable. And there was no hope for anyone to come close. It just didn't exist because I knew once I have the title, there's no way anyone is gonna take it. But if an Arnold win was inevitable, where was the drama? Where was the conflict? Every movie hero has to show his stuff by pushing up against an obstacle. Butler had to find it. I wanted to find a great antagonist for Arnold, and there was Louis Ferrigno in Brooklyn, New York, 6'8", 270, dark and foreboding. Muscle Magazine publisher Joe Weider had already had his eye on Ferrigno. For Weider, the old story Arnold wins again was growing stale. But a Mr. Olympia showdown between Lou and Arnold? This was perfect and exactly the kind of rivalry that sells magazines. He won the Mr. Universe contest in 1974 in Italy. Weider came back, I remember, like it was like a fresh breath of air. Ah, with a new champion on the horizon. Well, I had to stimulate them. And when I go into the gym and I saw him pick up 500 pounds, he says, what do you think, Joe? I said, oh, not bad, you can do better than that. <laughs> he got mad. So he would create this whole thing, and uh, you know, and I think it was really good because the fans loved all that, and that's exactly what I played up then in, in the movie Pumping Iron. In this outtake from Pumping Iron, Weider and Schwarzenegger discuss the very real possibility that the champ might actually lose to the larger and hungrier Ferrigno. You were the one who saw Lou in New York just a few yeah. days ago, so how does he look? He looks very, very massive. Well, he was my idol. He taught me getting into bodybuilding. Of course, when you have an idol like Arnold, you want to beat your idol to be the best. Wait till they see these dogs in Africa. <laughs> Terrific. Big enough to eat. Butler had his antagonist. Since 1969, nobody has beaten me, so what? why should he come around now all of a sudden and break my record? I don't know. He's training real hard. He's well, you will see. He's massive, and he's built almost like you. No. What happens if you are defeated? To enhance the drama, the filmmakers had to pump up the conflict. This is for the big baby, Louis. This is where documentary filmmaking is so effective, because you can do something with real people that a novelist just couldn't imagine. You create dialogue and hostility towards one another in order to make the movie more interesting. If it is just a sport, that you can see for 10 minutes, and then you have seen it all. But if you see the personalities, and you can follow them. 
A showdown was set. The Golden King versus the Dark Prince. Well, I was a bit of an outsider at that time in that world because I was the only one back training in Brooklyn. Brooklyn versus Venice, California, a bizarre beach town, a refuge for artists and hippies, weirdos and wackos. In its own strange way, bodybuilding fit right in. If the sport had an epicenter, it was a legendary Gold's Gym, which is where the filmmakers began shooting. Come on, Franco. What is this bullshit? Yeah. No, side chest, not front chest, Franco, side. Yeah, I mean, I, this thing's changed a little bit when we go to the side. <laughs> hey, look, Franco, what you have to do is when I say side chest, then hit the side chest and then it come out. And if you don't have it, don't hit it. No, don't hit it. Don't hit it. We had camaraderie that was incredible. We trained together. We'd go to the Gold's Gym at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's where everybody would meet. And I mean, the energy that came out of that little gym was only about 5,000 square feet. It could probably light up the city of Los Angeles. It's the mecca of bodybuilding. <laughs> when I got out of here, there was only this little bitty gym sitting out here close to the beach. I mean, it wasn't much bigger than YMCA where I'm from. It was like a house. And it was only basic weight. That's the only place we knew. That was home to us. The public at that point uh, didn't accept what we were doing. They didn't understand what we were doing. That was one of the joys of doing Pumping Iron, that people could really see that we just weren't big, huge people with muscles. We were all kind of tied together like this. We worked out together, we ate together, we were partying together. Rent was cheap. By day, they trained at Gold's or on nearby Muscle Beach. And at night, they let off steam often at Arnold's bachelor pad in Santa Monica. The main man is here, guys. The cameras never stop rolling. Get Mr. Universe, hey, 1975. Just to, to the Mr. World, the Mr. World. Yeah. Robbie Robinson. Oh, yeah, well, wait a minute. Let him hit a double shot, a double bicep shot for this lady here. Yeah, hit it sure. quick here. Hit a double bicep oh, shot. Yeah. Come on now. Come on now. Hit three oh, shots. Please. All right. Okay, we have some champagne. Okay, the era from like 1970 to 1980 was probably the most fun I ever had in my life. So we had this unformed subject, and everyone was very eager to make something out of it. These fellows that did the film, Butler and Gaines, they had become part of our family. We trusted them. Day after day, shooting scene after scene, Butler and co-director Robert Fiore were looking for their movie, material that would make the cut. They found that even watching this huge crowd order their huge lunch turned into an event. We went to the, to the restaurant where all the ordinary people were sitting, which we called the ordinary folks. And we were sitting there on the table, and people were just looking over kind of like, who are these guys? Oh my god. Big steak. Scrummered eggs. Six eggs like over here. The, the big steak and a one, the uh, tuna omelet. And a tuna omelet? Yeah. Oh, look what he's eating. He's eating three hamburgers in one shot. Oh, God, well, who are the, is this gladiators? I mean, they couldn't figure it out or who we were, you know? And we love that kind of a scene, you know, to, to, to shock people. The filmmakers often set up situations to see what would happen. So a lot of different chances were tried. They turned Schwarzenegger and Mike Katz loose in an amusement park. Hey, they, had a, they made a statue of Mike. That is a good one, Mike. They filmed Arnold with his acupuncturist. What does this mean? We're stimulating a muscle. OK, good night. Watched him get a haircut. Ask Arnold what sort of clothing he competes. What kind of clothing do you wear in competition? The little tiny posing trunks. Do you have to talk at all? No. That's... Except if you're the winner. So I talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> they were shooting, even overshooting, always looking for material to reveal Arnold's motives, his character, and what seemed at the time to be insanely ambitious dreams. I won the world championships so many times now that I would like to go on, you know, try to be the best in something else. Like what? I would like to get into acting. They said there was a tremendous struggle 
to make this movie really work and to make it really interesting, not only for the bodybuilding crowd, but for the general pop, uh, population. To do that, and to give the film some Hollywood sizzle, Butler approached Bud Court, the hot young star of M.A.S.H., Rooster McLeod, and Harold and Maude. I've never seen so many huge people in my life. That's why I joined you, Jim. I want to get my blood moving, you know? Yeah. All I do is Wait, drive and, and scream at my agent, you know? So I figured I'd, you know, get my blood moving. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was to send Bud to muscle master class with Arnold. Am I supposed to breathe before I stand up, during, or after? Uh, I know this thing. I hate it. Oh, I crack my neck. And when do I breathe in? I breathe out when? When do I breathe? In, out, right. He was very funny, and he happened to love bodybuilding. He just yeah. started thinking about that it's a beautiful exercise and that it makes your legs grow. And yeah, maybe I do change. all that psychological shit, but it doesn't work with me. It, it, no, it, it I get won't. pain in my Listen. leg. But after screening all his footage, Bud felt his scenes were too distracting from the main storyline. I yeah, think this whole yeah. thing is fucked. I think so, too. <laughs> <laughs> Bud pulled out asking the filmmakers to put the rest of his salary back into the project so they could finish. And I always teased him. I said, one day I'm going to take all of this footage that we shot and put it back into the movie. Now finally people are going to see it. Let me show you another exercise. OK. We did a scene of what we call the muscle rock, where we went up in the Malibu canyons and up to the top of the mountain there where they had the best uh, kind of lighting for taking photographs. So we brought uh, the, the whole camera team up there. In this outtake, Arnold and his buddies work on posing routines for the upcoming contest in South Africa. If Lou hits this one, I fall up. With this one. And Louis oh, he can't go into that, that one? Instantly with this one. Louis don't follow that one? He could, but you know, yeah. Arnold has done this one. You know what I mean? Right. Okay. <laughs> well, almost nothing uh, made it into the movies, but it was really a, a fantastic, I think, sequence. Uh, just to show again that we were all friends. Move on. Good. <laughs> Not bad. Big. Nobody will look at the legs. <laughs> oh! <laughs> the reason why it didn't really work was because when we edited the movie, we wanted to show some kind of a competition. The movie was Arnold, and it was critical to get to the heart of it. And the heart of it was the competition for the heavyweight crown and the conflict with Lou Ferrigno. Oh, oh, you're gonna wipe him out! And if he's in shape, fine. I hope he is. The filmmakers moved on to New York. In contrast to the fun and games of Gold's Gym, the Brooklyn setting was a dungeon. We filmed Louie in a dark sort of underground gym in Brooklyn, and then we'd immediately cut to Arnold Schwarzenegger. There were skylights overhead. Venice Beach was right outside the gym, the palm trees swinging to and fro. And in contrast to the sunny optimism of Arnold and his friends, Lou was as serious as a heart attack. Come on! Here I am in New York wearing sweat clothes. I got everybody around me in the gym that one-third of my size, people not looking like bodybuilders. You could see this one scene, I'm walking in, and one guy doing a dumbbell curl. Yeah, we got 10 right here. And it's hard to stay motivated. <laughs> the only way I can motivate myself is just keep screaming all his name in the gym and just keep pumping that heavy iron. Uh, Arnold, 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 Arnold! I was saying Arnold, Arnold. Arnold! I really wanted to beat Arnold Schwarzenegger. Hey, that's it. In Ferrigno, Butler found not just an antagonist, but a character rich with vulnerabilities. Partially deaf and overshadowed by a domineering father, Lou had everything to lose. What Butler invented was Matty Ferrigno's actual involvement in his son's bodybuilding career. Push it, man! Right. Come on, come on! I see, my father never really uh, was really involved in bodybuilding. And they asked him to be in the film. They thought it would be good to have father and son. In the movie, uh, Matty Ferrigno is a stage father to the best of intentions. And Matty had a very clear idea of what Louis should be doing. And it would just unroll in front of my eyes. When you step out there, boy, remember all those grueling nights and mornings in the gym. And this is it. This is the reward. And we want it. We kept 
printing on my head, this is your last chance. There's one scene you see me carrying dumbbells. 100 pound dumbbell. Afterwards, my father go, boy, what a workout. Oh, boy, what a workout. That's nice. Because he was holding one, one of the dumbbells. He's the one who's tired. You remind me of what you're going to show them. And then you go, boom, like you're saying, take a look at this hunk of man. Something like that, OK? You try it now. And he did the best he could. The fact, because at the time, I had the speech problem and everything, I was not able to conduct myself in interviews. He tried to be my voice. The unfolding relationship between father and son added an unexpected layer of tension and emotional richness to the film. As Maddie demonized Arnold, he wore his son down. There's only one thing in mind, and that's to beat that German. We've got to beat Arnold. He's been up there too long. You waited nine years for this shot, right? Be careful. He's going to try every trick. If he sees you look a little better, He's going to try and do something. He's going to try to make you look bad out there. Watch every move he makes. Try not to engage in conversation with him. And most of the time, I really wanted to say, let me speak for myself. Let me be who I am, please. You know, this is not how I want to conduct myself. This is not how I want to be in the film. Look out. That's right. That's it. No, no. Down here, Louis. I was not really me. I was beaten down. As Butler filmed and shaped his material, blending fact with fiction, the characters emerged as types, heightened versions of themselves. The self-invented, charismatic winner and the self-conscious, desperate underdog. Butler also honed his secondary characters, the bully, the family man, the master poser. Arnold's friend, Franco Colombo, was not so easily defined. So in 1975, the crew traveled to his tiny homeland in Sardinia to see what might happen. Not much did, except one of the more memorable moments of the film. My town is 2,000 people, when they're all in town. And of a sudden, they come, the crew comes there to film my parents and little things I did in the town. And there was nothing to do in the town. I could only walk and lift a car. And that's what I did. I could think, what could I do for, for the camera? Lift the car. My father was watching. Say, that's my son, he lifts cars, <laughs> you know? Another memorable moment was the infamous T-shirt incident, when Ken Waller, in an attempt to fluster his opponent, Mike Katz, hides his T-shirt. I see a blue, blue t-shirt around. In reality, the filmmakers made it more than it was. The thing about my part of it, like, they have to have a good guy and a bad guy to make something to the movie. Hey, you know what I'm gonna do when I get to Africa? I'm gonna take Katz's shirt, I'm gonna hide it. I hid the t-shirt, yeah. We knew that Waller had taken Katz's t-shirt, and we did follow that up. You know, back then, that sort of was my nature in a way, but it was all in joking. I considered Mike a friend. A friend of yours, you really don't want to hurt their feelings. At that time, I didn't ever think it was going to come out and be a big deal on a movie screen. As you learn later, I would go to contests after that, and I'd get booed because of, of what was said in that movie. And then there was Schwarzenegger himself. While already supremely confident, he made it a point to pump up his persona while the cameras were rolling. I played the, you know, the kind of uh, Germanic machine that comes over from over there, like a machine, nothing will stop him. I have to cut my emotions off and be kind of cold. No emotions, no feelings. I want to be the best, and I'm perfectly willing to go through anything to be the best. Anything to psych out his opponents, trying to chip away at their confidence, laughing all the while. I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> I tried anything and everything to sometimes look like, uh, you know, uh, this uh, evil guy. Franco is pretty smart, but Franco is a child. 
for me, it was like, I know I don't care. It was like, it doesn't matter what he says. When I'm on stage, I'm going to show that I'm the best. And I'm still convinced I was at least as good as Arnold on the stage that night of the Olympia, or maybe a little bit better. It doesn't matter if he wins or I win. To be honest with you, he was cocky. Uh, to be perfect, it's one of the hardest things to be, you know? He had a right to be. Of course you were competitive. Of course, uh, when he came down to the pose-off, and when he came down to who brings the best body in on the day of the competition, yeah, I was the most competitive. Uh, but now, since I'm uh, wiser and older, I've thought about many times if, like, you know, maybe I went a little overboard. Uh, but, you know, that's the way I did it then. That was my thinking process then, and, uh, you know, you can't go back and, and change it. But sometimes I regret it. In an attempt to soften the edges around Arnold Schwarzenegger, Charles Gaines, the author of the Pumping Iron book, came around to draw Arnold out, get him to warm up emotionally, reveal vulnerability. It didn't work, and it never made the cut. Scared? Do you ever get scared? Sure, I get scared. Oh, what? What scares you? The unknown. He felt like he couldn't get through to me because here yeah, I was this kind of one-dimensional guy that was just like made of steel. Of course, they want you to be all wide open. They want to be able to do that you are soft, that you're able to cry, because it puts them in the same boat and they say, well, he's just one of us. Now, you know what I think you're doing now? I think you're bullshitting now. No. I do. I think you What he really didn't realize was not that it was not vulnerable, but that I lived in denial, um, you know, my whole life. It's always like whenever I felt you know, pain or anything like this, it was like I, I forgot about it, I dismiss it. For some reason, maybe it has to do with competition, you just clamp down that capacity on yourself. If you carry it too far, what it winds up doing is just cutting you off from the possibility of having um, a really fundamental, reciprocal human relationship with some of you. So what? You don't care about no. that? No. Especially since I knew in bodybuilding and in competition, you have to kind of bury things temporarily. The, the way I dealt with it always is that right now I put it aside, and then I deal with it later on, whenever that is, you know? <laughs> Always on the front burner, though, was Arnold's ambition, which was on display in another sequence cut from the film. It's Arnold visiting with his idol, retired bodybuilding champ, Reg Park. Arnold was patterning his career after Park, who'd gone on to star in Hercules movies in the 60s. I think what perhaps happened to me about 15, 20 years ago is happening to you right now. I know, it's this incredible it's thing. The parallel you know? is unbelievable. Yeah, it's like a repetition, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. And I think that's why I looked up to you so much right from the beginning. He was a kid wanting to emulate what I'd done, so it was a great compliment to me, and I, I took it in that sense. Yeah, I remember in, in particular this one dream because I felt like I was dreaming for eight hours, I mean, the whole night. And it was just, uh, it was like, you know, me being a king and standing, uh, standing on top of a mountain, and there was no room left for anybody else up there, okay? Just for me. I mean, the whole thing was so much like, you know, a, a victory dream. The time had come. The Pumping Iron team had shot every scene they could to set up their characters at home. Now it was time to go where they were always headed, halfway around the world to the Mr. Olympia and Mr. Universe contest in Pretoria, South Africa. There'd be no more manipulated outcomes, no setting up scenes. The film crew would now be observers, not participants anymore. The competition was the real thing, and everyone be playing to win. It was tremendous adventure in those days. You want to go to Africa to make a movie about Arnold Schwarzenegger competing in the first multiracial contest in South Africa, then let's go to South Africa and do it. I mean, we were doing this by the seat of our pants. A revolution in technology, much like today's digital camera revolution, allowed the crew to shoot with more mobile, handheld 16 millimeter film cameras. With unprecedented access to the bodybuilders, the filmmakers set out to uncover the drama that was taking place behind the scenes. I, I think the, the wonderful part about the film was is that we didn't really feel because of our comfort and trust in the people that did the film that uh, the cameras were even rolling. So I think you got that real honest, down-to-earth kind of, of emotions and feeling. Roger Walker, Australia. There's a moment in the film in which you can almost see me on stage.
taking the shoulders of Joan Churchill, the uh, camera woman, and just turning the camera like this onto Mike Katz at the moment he lost. And then we just followed him downstairs. Uh, you know, as I look back on that, and I've seen it many times, I, I think most of us, many of us, will, will, will draw into ourselves and into our families in times of need. And I think, uh, ultimately, I think I just went back and wanted to know how my son was doing. Here's a head slate. We're going in to see cats. And I could, you know, usually I could say, look what I got, Michael, you know, and I put it around his neck or I give him the trophy for his room. And now I'm away from him for 10 days and I come home with nothing. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, no matter what happens to me in the sport, I always got them. And that's, that's something great to come home to. It was a way that uh, I could try to gather myself together with such a, a disappointment. It, it was a, at that point, it was a very, very big disappointment in my life, so. I uh, kind of gathered my strength from my family, yeah. When the Mr. Universe part of the competition was over, Waller had won. Next up, the main event, Mr. Olympia, with Arnold, Lou, and Franco all in the running. The film crews got into position. I was aware that there was going to be a marvelous confrontation between Arnold and Louis in the pump-up room. It was setting up the most wonderful opportunity for Arnold to do everything that he is capable of doing. The psyching part of bodybuilding, which is quite famous because of that scene and some others, um, is something that Arnold really does. Uh, <laughs> I love it, Louis. At least keep me entertained in the serious moments. The room we were in was only probably about 20 feet by 20 feet. I mean, it was this very small room. And you talk about a lot of tension, a lot of heat. So you can't help being, you know, kind of on the edgy side. The only thing that's left is on is bullshit. <laughs> that's why I'm up here, on. See? I'm not wearing boots. Lou, huh? what do you think your chances are today? I'm going to lose all of you. You're the best. Thank you. You're welcome. There's one there for your insurance. Everything is under control here. Beautiful. You're, you're going to be Go king far. a long time, Arnold. You're going to be king a long time. Thank you. More than 25 years later, Ferrigno recalls his feelings that night. I came out in the pre-judging. I realized that I was not going to come second. There's a chance I'm going to come third. And I'm looking at the audience, I can see my father's face. I was just, oh my god. It's like, because he was more disappointed than I was. Third place, Lou Ferrigno. I'll tell you something, what that boy of yours has done in a year, it's fantastic. Let me try, but yeah, no. You it's keep going, job. very say. wonderful job. Oh, wonderful, it's a good job. job. Yeah. wonderful. I knew that I was going to retire. And I would like to announce officially that I'm retiring from bodybuilding competition. That was my champ. But you know, history is history. Being in South Africa, what I really wanted more than anything was not really being Mr. Olympia, was being out in the open and having a good time like Arnold. That's what I want more than anything. That was more impressive to me. Who wants to be in South Africa, come second, come third, to be tenth? He was down there having fun, smoothing with people, shaking hands. That's what I'm doing now because it's taken me many years to see that. But that was my invention when I saw that that's one of the direction I wanted to go. For me to change that, I had to work on myself. The film was in the can. But now there was more than 100 hours of it to be cut down and crafted into a movie. Unfortunately, Butler was broke having maxed out on his credit cards. After I got back from Africa, I got a call every single day of the week from American Express, because I'd succeeded in running up a $35,000 bill. And I had become their most important client. I was rather impressed with myself. Out of desperation in 1976, they concocted an outlandish scheme. They put on a bodybuilding show at the prestigious Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City to try and attract potential backers. We invited Candy Bergen to photograph Arnold. The Whitney thought we might get 300 people, and someone said, you know, there's a pretty big crowd outside. 
You seen this crowd out there? No, I haven't looked out there. It's big. And I went down and looked, and there were 5,000 people outside trying to get in. Nobody's going to go in until we get a line here. Inside the museum, Arnold, Frank Zane, and Ed Corney were rotated on a turntable in front of the New York City art crowd. It was very sort of a uh, high concept idea. It was a risky scheme, and it was a long, long way from Venice Beach. Moderated by New York Times critic Vicki Goldberg, the event brought together some of the most prominent art historians in the world to watch bodybuilding. Uh, we are talking about a subject which is fascinating and quite present before our eyes a lot of the time. That is to say, the representation of the muscular body in art. The next bodybuilder who's coming out doesn't need an introduction to a lot of you, but he does to a lot more of you. As I said before, he's the greatest bodybuilder in the history of the sport. Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then we had this discussions about, you know, what is uh, uh, bodybuilding and compared to what uh, art was and how did, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and, uh, and, and uh, Rodin and all those guys come up with those muscles when they painted and sculpted uh, muscular bodies. The Whitney couldn't control the event because there were too many people there, so that instead of taking the money and putting it in a cash register, they had to throw the money into a pile on the floor. Hey, move down, two lines, okay? There was a six foot high pile of five dollar bills, and at the end of the day, the movie was financed, and the rest is history. The Whitney Museum event proved to investors that the general public just might be interested in bodybuilding. Now, it was time to present Pumping Iron to the world. Pumping up. On January 18th, 1977, Pumping Iron premiered at New York's Plaza Theater. Like Arnold and his friends were now the toast of New York City. Audiences loved the film, and critics gave it rave reviews. Pumping up, pumping but for the bodybuilders, it was a surreal experience seeing their private world revealed on the big screen. It was comical to us to see some of the things that come out in that movie. I was a bad guy, and back then, I thought that was sort of, that was all right. When I saw it for the first time, it made me very angry, because I suddenly saw how it portrayed. Calm him down. Help him. I was afraid people wouldn't like me. I was afraid people were going to look down on me, because the fact that here's a kid from Brooklyn, he's deaf, he can't speak, he looked dumb in the film. What I'm trying to say to you is at the time, I felt like a freak. But it wasn't like that. I didn't realize that within time, everyone embraced me. People come up and say, God, I love you in pumping iron. I love you in arm. All right. Come here. Speak. Nothing to say. I just want to eat my cake. It was so incredible to see the film on the big screen. And at the end of the film, when we were sitting in the bus going back and Arnold was joking with Lou, it was almost like breathing out, saying, now we can relax. In a way, it was naive. You know, it was a wonderful opportunity to just hang out together, train together, and be really part of a, of a family that continues to be close and friend, friendly to this day. We all stuck together and had fun doing it. There was a certain kind of a unity there and a certain kind of a camaraderie that was unlike anything else. And that's why when you look at it today, there's nothing else like popping iron. Here we are 25 years later celebrating it. So we must have done something right. So how you feel today, Lori? I feel better. Today, Dr. Franco Colombo is a practicing chiropractor in Los Angeles. Narrowing of cervical six, seven, and eight. He also produces and stars in low-budget films that he shoots in Sardinia. To this day, he and Arnold are best friends. Mike Katz is a judge for the International Federation of Bodybuilding and owns several world gyms in Connecticut where he trains up and coming bodybuilders. His son, Mike Jr., and his wife recently had a baby. Mike Katz is a grandfather. Ken Waller lives in Los Angeles. He has seen Gold's, the tiny seaside gym he once managed, evolve into a worldwide enterprise. What you doing, big guy? 
You show up. His focus now is on raising his son. Let's go talk about winning that medal, huh? As a sales manager at Extreme Activewear, the company that prints Gold's merchandise, he now has all the t-shirts he can get his hands on. Joe Weeder and his brother Ben continued promoting bodybuilding through their publishing empire and through the IFBB. What was once a subculture is now a multi-million dollar business. Ed Corney works in the fitness industry. He has had some health problems recently, but promises that even from a wheelchair, he can still outpose anyone from the old days. George Butler went on to direct Pumping Iron 2, The Women. He recently directed two documentaries on the life of Antarctic explorer, Ernest Shackleton. The films have earned rave reviews. Lou Ferrigno went on to a career in film and television, most notably starring as the Incredible Hulk. He's also a trainer to Hollywood stars and one of the most famous names in the health and fitness industry. The way they might cake. Remember that line? Matty Ferrigno retired to Florida and says he's very proud of his son. As for Arnold Schwarzenegger, he went on to make a few bucks in the movie business.